Hello there. Well, Air Sports GA Gold coverage turns its attention to Tyrone this week and specifically the 2005 and 2008 All Ireland Football Finals. I saw Mickey Hart's men defeat Kerry on both occasions. Iconic battles played out by some of the best players ever to play the game. And speaking of iconic, well, after a few weeks, I'm reunited with Joe Brawley once again, and I'm delighted to say we are in the company of three-time All-Ireland winner with Tyrone, the one and only Owen Mulligan. Gents, I hope you're both very well. Joe, if I come to you first, before we even talk about football, before we even talk tactics, talk shop, and talk about the finals, how pleased are you to be reunited with Owen? Well, it's impossible not to have a smile on your face in Owen's company, and uh, just as he was on the field. I mean, an extraordinary Gaelic footballer. In many ways, very underrated. I mean, people don't appreciate, for example, how powerful he was on the field. I mean, Owen Mulligan is a big man. you know, And I can remember standing beside him after they'd had an epic victory. In, Cro- in fact, I think it was a draw. And he had been brilliant that day. And typical of Owen, you know, restlessly standing outside in the tunnel. You see an and he says to me, Brawley, he says, is there anywhere we can go for a quiet pint? I said to him, Owen, you look like Sid Vicious. You scored the greatest goal that's ever been scored in Croke Park. Your days of quiet pints are over. And, uh, you know, that, that, that was classic Owen, always with a sense of fun and an extraordinary Gaelic footballer for club and for county. Don't forget, he powered his very small uh, club father, Ox and Cookstown, to two All-Irelands, two club All-Irelands against fierce and carry opposition on both occasions. And uh, I don't know, you know, his legacy will be a tremendous one because you remember footballers like that with great affection. And the other thing about Owen, of course, was that there was no nonsense on the field. He was manly. He played the game the right way. You know, he played it in great spirit. There was no meanness with him or anything like that. And I think that that sort of thing... uh, stays with you. It brings you good luck and good karma and uh, I'm delighted to see him uh, looking so well today. Minus (laughs) minus the bleached blonde hair. (laughs) I I don't know how you respond to that one, Owen. Uh, Very kind words from Joseph Joseph there. Uh, I remember uh, 2003 when I uh, in the RTE commentary boxes where he slagged us off a few times so I heard his name Brandon around the change rooms a couple of times uh, by uh, Michael Hart should we say uh, to, to get us psyched up but look I think he's a silent Tyrone fan anyway to be honest with you <laughs> I, remember, I remember one day on you're, you're bound to remember this you had you had just beaten Armagh in the All-Ireland semi-final Peter Canavan had kicked the free to win it right at the death. Our mad oh, well. putting the ball away when it looked as though our mad were going to push on. And uh, after the game, I had been given by a Tyrone fan whose son was very unwell, a Tyrone jersey, and he'd asked me if I'd go to the Tyrone change room and get it signed. He says, I said, for fuck's sake. <laughs> it was a good moment that he was actually to knock the door. And Father Jared McAleer, who'd been the dean of discipline in St. Pat's Armagh, when I was a boarder there, you see, he was the team pastor and obsessed with Gaelic football. And also, he, he, had a, he had a very formidable Gaelic football brain, you know. But anyway, I went in, and I was sort of ushered in. And they were standing in a circle in the middle of a very long, solemn prayer, you see. <laughs> and you can see Mulligan's Bull- looking over at me, going like, <laughs> <laughs> He was uncomfortable in this sort of uh, uh-huh. Mormon atmosphere, but uh, I had to try to laugh, and you know I had to keep a completely straight face. It was uh, I remember uh, every Sunday morning we uh, would have to go to mass, you know, and uh, I was always kind of late, so I would do like a genuflect in front of the team, you know. <laughs> To our greatness and Far McAleer and Hub would come behind me and just the real messers. It was real uh, piss take, but you could see heart chuckling away too. So he, he knew the crack, and I think that was a part of the banter with uh, with all the lads. It was a you know, you know a real sense of uh, crack. But when when the serious stuff uh, started, that's that's when that's when we come out to play. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, the, the 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 launch pad really for the team because the the 
quite a few of them had won all Ireland minors, and I can remember very clearly they they played Derry. Derry were a very unpredictable team. I think it won the national league the previous year. Enda Muldoon was playing Niall McCosker, who was Owen's nemesis, really on the yeah. field, from Ballanderry, who'd led Ballanderry to the All Ireland Club title, and uh, not given Colin Corkery a kick. And I mean, he was monstrous. His physique was monstrous, and he was pure relaxed about the game because he was an expert Gaelic footballer, like a proper expert. And it's just a pity he suffered a terrible back injury because he was involved in. Is that two thousand and three, Joe? Yeah, two thousand and three. Right. But in two thousand. You should have beat us that day, in Clonus. You should have beat us. I remember coming off. I remember coming off at half time. We had we had done the we had won the national league two weeks before, That's right. and um, I played well that day in Croke Park. I got man of the match. But I remember going at half time, and somebody shouts to the Derry jersey, "Where the fuck's your blonde bombshell now?" <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, I, I was like, "Oh, it's sick!" But McCusker uh, was class that day. I went. I I, I grew up with Nile. I grew up in Ireland some passes and he was always the best. He was always the best player. He was always the best in PE. He was always the biggest, the strongest. So he knew my sort of tricks. He knew every dummy I had. And he just, he just stood up, stood up that day. And he never gave me a kick. I think I scored a point from a free kick. I, I was very lucky to start the second day in Belfast. Um, and Hart, Hart played me as a third midfielder just to get out of the corner, away from him. I, I remember that day so vividly because in the, in the 2003 first round, which, as I recall it, correct me if I'm wrong, it was played in Clonus because there was such an interest in it. Yes. Uh, and the, uh, as you say, halfway through the second half, because McCosker had you completely tied up. He did, yeah. You wouldn't understand what a brilliant footballer he was. I mean, he I was, was class. He was unbelievable. And, you know, he was going to be the linchpin of a dairy team for a long time, and then he got that terrible back injury and wasn't able to continue. But... And he was pure relaxed about the game, you know, and he would away to you. He was an awful trash talker, like it had been in your right. ear all the time. But mm. that game in Clonus, Tyrone rescued it with a point. Yeah. You know, the game was over and they rescued it with a point. Can't remember who scored it. I but, can't remember myself. I can't, I can't remember, but it was, uh, you, we were point. I think it was, it was well in the injury time as well. But then in the replay up in Casewell Park, which there was a huge crowd and they had the game at Casewell Park. Then. And again, those were the heydays of Ulster football, really. And I remember Big Anthony Toho was playing midfield. Sean Marty Lockhart was, was picking up Canavan, you know. Um, and, and McCosker was again on you. But that day, after about 10 minutes, I was sitting beside Fergal McCosker. I go, for fuck's sake. <laughs> You could see then they could play. Ryan McMenamin was running riot. Their forward line was absolutely electric, you know. And and Sean Kavanagh that day. That was the first day time that I realised. Oh, and I wrote it then afterwards. These boys were special. It was different. And they played Derry off the park. And they had that. They had already started to work on that thing where Kavanagh didn't really play midfield. He sat off, he sat off, he waited, and then he made runs through the middle. And their movement, their scoring, and I mean, after, I think after about 15 minutes that day when the game was over, and you, it was, and it was the first time since we, we, we played Tyrone in 1997, I think it was, and destroyed them yeah. in an Ulster semi final. Yeah. Know, destroyed them. And that was the first time in living memory that that had ever happened between Derry and Tyrone. But then the next time it happened was 2003, whenever these boys announced their arrival. And then it was clear that they were special. Mm. Was that before the 13 men or after the 13 men, Joe, we beat you by? After. <laughs> <laughs> they had an arm broken. They were so lucky. I was sitting up with a broken arm. We'd been in the National League. Were you not playing? Were you not playing? No, I had broken my arm in the National League final. Oh, fuck. And we would have... I kept looking at it thinking... That Tyrone fullback lane is so bad, uh, and I thought we were. But I thought it all. I thought through the first half we were going to pulverise them, and then when Tyrone got the men sent off, it had exactly the opposite impact on Derry. Derry sort of stopped completely. That day, that was but the best game. I was back to the point that your your that performance that day was exhilarating. It was virtually perfect, and you realised then. These boys are are, are are serious. And, you know, they had such great players. Mm. Brian McGuigan, 
What a Gaelic football ground. Unbelievable. Like Unbelievable. a wee meerkat. When he got the ball, I was I always pictured him like a wee meerkat, you know, emerging out of the hole to take a wee look around. You know, and he was left foot, right foot, and of course he didn't like his skills off the ground. No. But on top of his he, uh, ability, he, he had such he was such a brilliant team player. He uh I think you're talking about some of us don't get the credit. I don't think he gets the credit that he deserves because at the end of the day, everybody talks about the Stevie Neils, the Peter Kellerman, the Owen Mulligans, but he supplied the ball all the time to us. And it wasn't he wasn't giving you a 50-50 ball. It was like, you had to do that like the basketballer and he put it into your hand or else he put it out in front of him. That's, that's, you did that in front of him. It was just one bounce. You got it and you turned Canavan off the shoulder. You popped it or whatever it was, vice versa. The, another one was Jared Cavill. And, I, and, I, and the, the ball he given was exceptional. So them two players, and the beginning, and do her was your work rate. And, you know, the, our tactics weren't that difficult. Horse, a bit, a bit say, not uh, pacey at the back. And the beginning dropped in front of him. And that was it. Mandy Bainley came out as a third, kind of a third midfielder and worked and let Horse drop into the pocket. And that's the way it was. And it worked well till I think Dublin kind of caught on in later years to put somebody on Gavin Devon. And Brogan was, was that man and I think destroyed him one day. But it worked probably from what, 2003 right through to 2008. We got them all learners and that's all it was. Everybody was saying, oh, uh, Hart was a tactician, Hart was this, Hart was that. He, he was class motivator, class organiser. But the players... It was all player driven. The players seen trouble and they sniffed it out, and that's the way it was. You know, if you couldn't, if you couldn't see things on the pitch and deal with it yourself, you know, you're in the road to no time, and that's mm. the way it was. You, you're talking about Brian McGuigan, for example. I mean, I sat. I know that Sean Cavan is a very odd type of a fella, and I watched that the Sunday game, as I call it, the morgue. I watched the morgue last Sunday night. You see. And Gavin was there, and they were picking a, picking a combined drone carry team from the Nauties. I mean, first of all, which was very funny, to Moss O'Shea, obviously, when he picked the team, he didn't pick himself. And obviously, he, you know, needless to say, Cal- Calvin was, Calvin was yeah. the first name in the team sheet when he picked yeah. the team, Gavin. But he didn't, <laughs> he didn't pick you. <laughs> he didn't pick you. But he picked, he picked that fellow, Declan O'Sullivan. You know, he was a solar runner and a good player and all of that, but I mean, yeah. Yeah, Brian McGuigan, I mean, extraordinary. Brian McGuigan in 2003 had a season for the ages. And as you say, Owen, he was the footballer's footballer. Oh. It wasn't flashy, but boy, I mean, I remember he made, he made Kieran McGinney's headlight. Mm-hmm. He made his headlight. Do you know and, what, Joe? He then was they all the final, 2005. Mm-hmm. If there's yeah. if there's ever been a better individual performance in, a, yeah. in an All Ireland final, yeah. I get to see it. He scored four points from play. Yeah. I think he have something like ten assists. Yeah. He was on the ball forty times. Yeah, but, I mean, as you say, the passes. Oh, yeah. they they, I have yet to see another Gaelic footballer like Brian that's two steps ahead of everything. He's two steps ahead of you, and then you can have him. He was two steps ahead of you, and everybody's saying, you know. I was lucky enough to be in that team because they were the first two boys you had to pick up. So I wasn't getting the best defender marking me. I was getting the third. I was getting the third best. And that was, I was maybe getting the better. And then you looked on the other side and you had Stevie O'Neill. So we had, me and Stevie were getting the third and fourth best defenders. Well, while McGuigan and Callum was getting the best too. So that freed us up. You know, I can't, you know, I've read about McGuigan so many times. He was a joy to play with. You know, he was a you know the the supplier, the orchestrator, if you wanna if you wanna call him that, he was a, he was an unreal player. And 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 poetry in motion. Oh man, he, he was, was he was he was brilliant. Now, and I'm not the day, or, the other day you, you played Monaghan, and Monaghan were under Seamus McAdeney, and they were really went for you. It was in the McKenna Cup game, but again, mm-hmm. it was at the time of the heyday, and it was televised live. Yeah. And Monaghan went seven eight points up. It was maybe eight or nine minutes to go. And then McGuigan orchestrated the comeback. But it was one of it's one of my favourite moments in Gaelic football. Remember it vividly. A ball was kicked to the so as McGuigan's looking at it from centre forward, the ball's kicked to the left wing. He runs to the left wing, he picks the ball up. He immediately as he as he's winning the ball, he's looking over his shoulder and he turns and with the instep of his right foot from the corner. He kicks a perfect pass to Martin Penrose, who's running through the middle. Uh, just over the top of the fullback. Penrose catches it net. No, that, no, that's, that was McGuigan. It was like Larry Bird playing for the Celtics. He could see no. it. As you say, 
before everybody else. Before everybody else, Joe, that's that was the beauty. I, t- I tell you, that was I remember that McKenna Cup because Rory Big uh, Rory Woods was playing that day, and he came on, <laughs> he came on and racing started to look at me and, and laugh. <laughs> and Rory Rory says. What the fuck's wrong with you, racing? And he said, "Jesus, Rory, you have wintered well this year." <laughs> <laughs> so that was only the start of it. That's that's uh, just before he handed him the pre- pregnancy test and said, "Give that to your mother." <laughs> <laughs> ah, he was right. That with him, that, that was the beauty. It was a, there was a, a couple of bad children in, in that uh, Tyrone team, and they could mix it. So Hart used to say, "I'm not telling you what to do, but you know yourself." How to take care of them boys. <laughs> right. Mickey, Mickey, Mickey was always good at plausible deniability. <laughs> I, tell you, I tell you who was a, a brilliant footballer as well. Like in every way. And fearsome was Conor Gormley. Oh, man. I, I mean, again, another player. People don't appreciate how good he was. And also, a bit like you, Muxy, people don't appreciate how big he was. I, I mean, was, uh... the man with Michael Murphy, he played midfield for his club, Carrick Moore. He won two or three championships with them driving them on. And he, his footballing ability was peerless. I think he's still playing, Joe. He's, and he's still in the same shape that he is. He, do, he doesn't abuse himself, doesn't smoke, drink, you know, that, that sort of stuff. And, you know, um, he's... Everybody says, you know, 2003. Um, I know Hearts come out and says, uh, you know, the, the block, the Stephen Neal block. I think we want to get back into the game uh, the way that strong team was. If that goal had went in, Armagh would have won the North Ireland, with, with, absolutely, and I've heard Hart coming out and saying that. Oh, that he, no, we want to come back. We wouldn't have come back. Yeah. Conor Gormley that day was thrown savior because Stephen Neal, if you remember, he had he had picked up Player of the Year in two thousand and two. He had a some season in two thousand and three. They were going for a, a double All Ireland. He was going for double Player of the Year. That was going. That ball was going straight into the top corner. Straight into the top corner. Why, why, he, changed foot, why he changed foot at the last minute? Mm-hmm. I'll never know. I spoke to Stevie about this. The only the only reason that Gormley got a chance to block it was because he he switched foot at the last second. But he was going, which he, he was never going did. Top corner, Joe. He was uh-huh. going top corner, and it probably he, like I've seen him so many times roofing it into the net. And if you ever watch the block, Gormley gets right down on his foot. Uh-huh. You know, it's it was it's a super block, a super it went one throw in the All Ireland. I've always said that. I think he, he was also one of those players on that, and you could see it the and I. We had an earlier program one in this air series where um, Alan Brogan talked about this. You'll remember when he said that uh, he said that his heart sank whenever Gormley used to come to market. I thought. I thought. Uh, I and, thought and, uh, that, that was that was what he did to opponents. Yeah, because he was yeah. also so strong. He he stood up on the tackle, Joe. He was very disciplined in the tackle, uh, but he he would know how to leave it in in the right way, as in. You know, he would go for the ball and get the ball, but follow through. And I got him so many times at Trim. He would get the ball and follow through and come. To, he'd, he'd go through like a steam train. He'd like, and he, the reason why I loved, loved him playing is if you get into a bit of a sort of argy bargy in the field, there was Hub Cues, there was Connor Gormley, and they were always had your back. Always. You know, you would say, I not beat you, but I know two boys that will. And then boys were behind you like this, and they were always on your shoulder. Great team players. Now, don't get me wrong; they're not going to fill you in dirty, or not going to hit you a box in the mouth. But they had your back all the time, and that's what it, that's what, what you, them that's what successful teams need. Yeah. Although Kevin wouldn't have had Kevin wouldn't have had Connor's all round ability. I mean, Connor Gormley could come forward from centre yes. back and back and kick a magnificent score. Yeah, you know, he, he had brilliant presence. He was a great passer of the ball. I mean. I, he was a player who I always felt had really no flaws as a Gaelic footballer. Mm-hmm. But he, you, you he played with him. He didn't play minors or under twenty ones, so he didn't. He didn't. He didn't get on. But I remember Margaret and Club. He was. He was just. I got the batter of him a few times. This was before the whole Conor Gormley sort of name come out. But it's just his improvement, 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 and you know, I suppose it's down to like different managers, you know, coaches and stuff. Taking them under his wing, like, and I remember Tally used to talk to him all the time, and you know how to defend, how to mark, and he was a great man for marking space and reading the game, and 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 telling people what they're doing. Now, he wouldn't tell him, he wouldn't tell you softly. He'd be shouting at you, get the fuck. Why is yeah. this man coming through? What are you doing? You know, and you you know you you kind of said, Jesus Christ, he's right. You know, he's right. So that's the way it was. He was an organizer at the back. He, he was one of those. He, he was an essential component in a winning team because he was a flat out winner. Mm. You know, and. 
he, he, he had that thing, I think, which the great, great players have, which is that he's remote. You know, he was a teammate of yours, mm-hmm. but he was never distracted on the field. No matter no. what was happening, he was focused on, on winning the game. And yeah. I think that's very off-putting for opponents. It was like Peter Cannon was always talked about being marked by Kieran McKeever. Everybody mm. else was, it was a big fuss mark on Peter Cannon. Oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, what am I going to do? Oh, uh, we get it, oh, Jesus. McKeever was just like, you're uh, not there. You're not there. Uh, it doesn't, uh, doesn't concern me what you do. I yeah. will do what I do. And that's what yeah. Gromley was like. And it's very off-putting for all but the strongest opponents mentally. Without, without doubt, he, uh, as I said, he was, a, he was a captain of the back line. He organised everything. You know, if the man, like that man's coming through there, this man's able to talk to you at half time, over and talk to you, chat to you, what's going on there, this man's coming through there, why can, why can you not stop him? And he'd break it down, well, where's he coming from? You know, and this was going on at half time, and I was going, Jesus, man, let's just let me drink my water for fuck's sake, you know, uh, you know, just calm down to get a break here. But he was, that's the sort of player he was, he was a leader on the field, and he was, you know, top class. Mm-hmm. Well, it was the sort of thing, Shane, that uh, you, you don't often see anymore, that Tron team. Which was, I suppose, typical of that era of Gaelic football until we got into this going through the motions sort of football. And a lot of the fun has been taken out of it with the long drawn out championship and qualifiers and Southern Death's going and all that. But they were a team full of characters, all different characters, you know. Like you had Owen with all his terrific flamboyance, you know, through to somebody like Stephen O'Neill, who was just a footballer and very, very quiet presence on and off the field albeit that he had amazing skills, Canavan's aggression and, you know, that sort of gladiatorial approach that he brought to it, you know, the dutiful wing back like Philip Jordan, who just dutifully channeled up and down the field, you know, Ryan McMenamin and the snarling, horrible monster that he is, <laughs> you know, but again, but again, like Owen or this was terrific fella off the field. I mean, to go for a mate with Ryan McMenamin, it's just, it's just crack from start to finish, you know, or Kevin Hughes. It's hard to beat the glacial men. Ah, uh, good lads, <laughs> good lads. Look, but this, are we, like, this is the crack. You know, you see, for instance, you follow the, the current own team on, on social media and, you know, all right, you, they're flat out and they're men and their physiques are unbelievable. But after matches, you see them putting up on Instagram, they're, they're in the weights room again. Like, that was, oh, that is crazy for me. That is, that's, you know, we didn't come, we didn't come back. They all stayed, they used to go back to my mother's house in Cookstown beside the Glavin. All the kit bags were there on Monday morning. You know, this was the growing up minors under twenty ones. And it still was the same as seniors. It was Kevin Hughes, it was Philip Jordan, the great Cormac McAnall. Everybody was just all around the living room. My, my mother cooking fries. They still talk about it. They still talk about, oh, what about your mother? You know, the crack's good. And that kind of Bond you that kind of you know you, women, you women, 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 women sneaking out with their clothes over oh, their shoulder. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh, you know, like you know, like the, the the tiles the tiles tied together and you're you know sneaking them out sneaking them out the window. But the crack was the crack <laughs> the crack was ninety the crack was ninety them days and it just it, it went from minor on the time and senior and it helped everybody. And when we got on the senior team, the experience was there just to to bond together. You know. Hmm. Lads, I want to bring it on to the 2005 final. I, you've set the scene perfectly there for the, for the last 20 minutes. Some really big characters. Um, and I suppose the mentality of, of, of Gaelic football at that time and how different it was. But you've mentioned already, anyway, Throne lifted Sam in 03. You beat Kerry along the way in the semi final, Armand the final. Kerry then 2004 champions. But then we arrive at 2005. And I don't think it's overstating it to say, one of the greatest All Ireland finals in recent memory. Joe Brawley, would you agree with that? I, I've said it many, many times, and, uh, and, and I'm looking forward to watching it again this week. Uh, it, was, it was, I think, the peak of Tyrone's art. That was the peak because it was a very good Kerry team, and they got off to a superb start. Dara Kinead just scored the most improbably brilliant goal in the first 10 minutes, Kerry went five up. And for me, again, it was cementing the idea of Jerome's greatness because there was no suggestion or question that they would wilt. It was almost as if they, all right, here we go. This is good. This is good. And from then on, it was 
uh, an absolutely dominant performance. And in the context of, I want to make one of the striking things about that team, Owen has sort of adverted to it. They played with the third midfielder. Sean Kavanaugh wasn't a ball-winning midfielder. You know, he wasn't a Tohill or he wasn't a McGilligan, nor he wasn't a Brian Fenton, James McCarthy. He wasn't that sort of player. He was a loose player who, if you like, you know, he, he, his, his raison d'etre was to get off, get off the man's shoulder and get the point scored, you know. And uh, so Tyrone that day, as was quite regularly the case, were absolutely dominated in midfield by Kerry. Completely dominated. And Tyrone had worked over a period of time with, I remember against Donny Goyle, you did this very effectively with Colin McFadden. They, knowing that Colin McFadden was going to win the ball, they drowned him. They were on top of him. Their hands were in his face. When he won the ball, then he was tied up. And we saw that was Darrell Shea playing midfield for Kerry. So that one of the extraordinary features of that team, if you look at the statistics, was although they were constantly beaten at midfield, the other team was never turning that into scores, which you would normally see if you look at statistics. Tyrone were working on that, appreciating that deficiency, but concentrating on it so that Kerry had no advantage there. Mm -hmm. And in spite of the fact that Kerry had that stranglehold at midfield, I mean, Tyrone, for me, completely dominated the remainder of that game. Kerry got a goal against the head. Tomas O'Shea had a lash at it that brought them back into it. But in truth, there was never any real sense. You know, you, you were talking about a team, a brilliant team on a different level. You know, so I always say, look, for me, there's no question. This nonsense about who were Kerry, the team of the decade. Three times, three emphatic defeats. You know, and it cannot be clearer than that. Um, Tyrone coming out of a much more difficult province battling with a brilliant Armagh team. Had they been in any other province zone, I think you'll agree with yeah. me. Yeah. What happened was eventually Tyrone just broke them down. Continuous heartbreak, beating them by a point here, beating them by a point there, losing to them in an Ulster final, then beating them in an All-Ireland quarterfinal or semi-final. You know, but had they been in any other province? Plus there was a very, very good Donegal team at that stage on the go in Ulster. Yeah. Again, huge battles there to come through. So for me, that 2005 final exemplified, you know, Tyrone's greatness as, which I wouldn't put that Kerry team during those years. They were coming through Munster, sure. They beat Mayo, who were really cannon fodder and not ready for the fray. Not a serious team, not like these boys, for example. Um, but I wouldn't rate them as a great team. They had some very good players and they played some very good football. But the Tyrone team, if you're picking out teams from eras, you know, and I don't say this lightly as a, as a dairy man, or as Owen would say when he's singing in the terraces, there's no London in Tyrone. <laughs> 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 uh, as a dairyman, you would have to say that they were, you know, truly a great team. Mm. Uh, and, and I think that they, that was the day that you realised just how special they were. Sure, they'd won the All-Ireland in 2003. Bit of credit was taken from them. I didn't think they played that well in the final. You should have destroyed Armagh. You missed five goal chances. So it was really 2005 when they were ready to showcase how good they were. And uh, I thought that it was a, a, a marvellous, thrilling performance from start to finish. Certainly. Uh, Owen, just focusing in on the start, I know Joe mentioned it there. I mean, Gooch and Brosnan hit super scores after 90 seconds of just carnage. It's hit after hit, loads of turnovers, yeah. really high energy football. And then six minutes gone, Galvin plays the ball in, a superb run from Colin Cooper and, and Okanaja, um, gets the goal. What was going through your mind at that point of the match? You always fear that sort of thing and you've always worked on tactics and, and different things like that. And what if this, what if this happens in different scenarios of, of playing, playing the game in all Ireland finals? And we did work on things like that. If, if we go down four points, if we go down five points, uh, what do we do? So we had a regroup. They come out. Kerry come out like men possessed. I remember they were hitting everything in motion. They, they cleaned us out in midfield. I remember it well. And the reason I thought for this was we were missing Kevin Hughes in 2005. He went to Australia, so he did. And he missed the 2005 and got back and won it in 2008. And if you ask Star O'Shea, who's his toughest opponent, opponent well, was, he'll always say Kevin Hughes or one of them anyway. Them two just cancelled each other out. Them two just 
uh, used each other as battle rams in 2003 semi-final. It was a it was a fierce, fierce encounter. I think they hated marking each other, but they had most respect for each other. So, you know, the midfield that day cleaned us totally out. Um, our defence were exceptional. Racy that day and Philly Jordan were exceptional. But when you go down five points in the Northern Ireland final, it's very hard to claw back. It's very, you know, you're saying, right, there's a head start. We've got a head start. So you need it. You need to just keep, you know, pegging the points back, pegging points back. And that's what we did. And um, Ryan Mallon, I think, came out with the first two points uh, to start uh, clawing it back. And again, another man that gets, uh, doesn't really get the credit he deserves. He was excellent that day. Um, but as I said, we just, that was the, the whole team ethos never lay down and, and, and never take a step back. And we once we got ahead, I don't think there was any uh, really any threats. Joe says there about Tomas rattling one on the net. Philly Jordan went up straight after it and scored, come right through the middle and scored an outside of the boot point. That's the difference, you know, and winning and winning and losing when you can when you can regroup and get them important scores and, and that's what we did that day. We didn't take the foot of the foot of the gas. We've all Hart used to say, you know, we didn't get the credit two thousand and three we deserved. The great Conrad and Allen died in 2004, and we used that as a crutch, as, as an excuse. And 2005, then we won it. So we were expecting everybody saying, "Ah, oh, Thrones won two our irons." We were raging. We didn't want to travel. That's that's the mindset we were. Uh, you know, we were going through. And mm-hmm. um, so that's yeah, because big, big, uh, big uh, Brady from Ballina in the quarter final the previous year again. Your midfield deficiencies. Mm. Yeah, big Brady and riot. That so, in the quarter I, I, I thought, I thought, as you know, Kevin Hughes, like I thought, when he did go travelling, um, I thought that he they left a, a big, he left a big void there. Yeah. Hub, Hub was a serious catcher of the ball. He got up for the, He wasn't that tall. He wasn't the, the tallest midfielder in, oh, in the country, God. but he was. But and he had a great, great leap. He used to, you know, you know, like an Aussie rules on top of your back. So he left. He left, and then and he had a great attitude too. He didn't take it that oh. seriously. He was like you. He loved the game, but it was a game, you know. And, uh, he, was, he, he was some player. But, some but I think that I think that the two thousand and five thing, to be more precise about diagnosing it, what it showed was, whenever you were five points behind, that this was a team that was not only ferocious in its commitment, which I think is what Kerry Kerry's mistake was to think they wanted it more than we did in 2003. And their commitment was so ferocious to that game that we didn't match them. And we are not going to fall into that trap in 2005. We're going to give them everything back that they gave to us with interest. Yeah. And the problem with that was that not only in 2005, you know, were you able to illustrate that ferocious commitment all over the field again, but it was like all really great teams that regardless of how hot it gets, every player was making the right decisions. Mm. Like, if there's a better goal scored in Croke Park, obviously, I say, yours was the greatest. There's, I think there can be no... From every perspective, even from the perspective of the general hilarity of it, <laughs> but from every perspective, I think, I think the, the time that it was scored, the fact that it was so badly needed, the way the ball was moved up field, your movement, your vision, what you did, I mean, it was extraordinary and will never be repeated. Maybe David Clifford will get one in due mm. course over the next eight years, but you know, there are going to be very few contenders. But the goal that was scored exemplified Tyrone's different level, you know, where it goes to the wing. I think it was Philip Jordan's carrying it up the right wing, kicks the ball to Owen. Mulligan was Owen was brilliant in the air. I mean he was absolutely brilliant. I remember one day in an Ulster Club intermediate final, you were playing Warren Point. Yeah. One was playing full forward, and they dogged him. It went, as I recall, it went to a replay. No, it went into extra time. It went into the extra time, that's correct. It went to extra time, but they dogged him and dogged him. And come the crucial moments down the stretch, those hands, like, they, the Cookstown boys were putting the ball in the air to him. Jesus, those hands didn't fail him, and that nerve never failed him. I mean, that was a brilliant catch. Of course, Owen's a big, big, strong man. Like you were, were you were a plaster by trade, weren't you? No, a chippy joiner. Oh, you were a chippy, big, strong fella, you know. And I mean, you watched the way he took that ball so securely and the perfect time. And I love the moving of the left shoulder, pretending to the goalkeeper that he's turning there, knowing rightly. And again, that great chemistry they had. Cadavan knew what he was doing. 
Canada makes their own to here. One turns to here. Just takes them slightly out of their rhythm, you know, makes them a wee bit uncertain about what's going to happen. Perfect time and shields it, drops it off to Canada. And, and Peter obviously passes it in, you know, as he, as he always did. And, and that, in a way, summed up their art. And that was the end of the game because that was, I think, just on half time. I think yeah. having been five points down, you were now about five points up. And um, everything thereafter was a victory period. Yeah. We, uh, we, in the semi final against Armagh, um, Armagh were serious for giving diagonal ball. That was their tactic diagonal ball, McGinney straight on the, uh, I think it was Clark and McDonald at the time. So we tried to emulate that in the semi final. So we got serious joy in the semi final doing that. I was marking value. I thought at a point to prove. So the diagonal ball was working flat out. We got serious scores. So when Philly got it, I, I thought Kerry were a bit loose in the goal. I thought, you know, they, they left Paul Galvin on me and I was maybe half a head, you know, taller than Paul. So that's the ball come in and, and you know, I'd hate to, I fancied myself. I actually fancied the shot first. So I did. Um, I, I had it in my head as soon as I catch this ball and going to rattle it. But I squirted it off to Canavan and I always asked ask Canavan, why did you not blast it? Like, why did you not, you know, you know, for, if a forward's instinct, go far side, go far side. He says he was on an all-star trip and he says he was through for a couple of goals uh, in the match you play. And he says, the big man just kept picking me off because I was blasting him, saving it, saving it, saving it. Extraordinary saves. And he just rolled it into the corner. So, like, that was in his head. That was in his head from the end. Like, so that's, that's the pure brilliance of the man. Yeah, but the other thing with Peter was that, I mean, we, you know, I used to, think about scoring goals all the time, you know, more than yourself. And, you know, the, the, every keeper in history, this is what they do. So if you're coming down, if you're coming down on your left foot, on the left, on the left wing of the goals on the right. left side, right, he steps, the keeper steps to his right to uh -huh. dive to his left. Uh -huh. Right. So all you do is, I mean, I never did this. If you watch me scoring goals, like they're always just tipped in at the near <laughs> So I was waited, you know, <laughs> you say, dive, just tip it, rolled in at the near post. I, I don't think I scored one spectacular goal in my entire career. It was an all Ireland, it was a national league semi final in Croke Park against Mayo. Off my right foot from about 30 metres into the far post. I'd love if somebody could find the goal because it was like really, really, really spectacular, you know. And, and, and I could do this on my right foot. But that was it. And I was almost afterwards saying to myself, Christ, that's the last time I'm trying that. <laughs> I, did it. I, a, I thought I'll do a Royal Rovers, I'll take a welt at it. You know, I mean, every one of my goals is completely forgettable for that reason that I thought well, our boys really like we dummy and then pass it near side, you know. But Peter was the master of that. And Owen, I don't know if you recall it, but um, in 1996, I think it was, um, I was playing that day and Derry had no excuse. You know, Tyrone beat us and we were poor and the team had lost morale with the Mickey Moran coup and all that. And uh, But there were really no excuses that day. Um, and Canavan scored the killer goal. And, and again that day, he took a, I think he took a pass from, I can't remember who it was, McBride, out in the sideline. He was coming through them. He was coming through, you know, one of those mazy runs that he makes. Yeah. And with Canavan, you see, he didn't know if he was going to go left or right. Yeah. But Damien McCusker was just about to stand up, doing the thing of his, moving to his right to dive to his left. And all of a sudden, the ball's in the net in the near post. Oh, just yeah, like, I remember now. I remember now. Like he, he, he just, he just he kicked it straight. He just yeah, kicked he it straight as he no. came. And, you know, he, he took that. This, this is not a... He took that from 25 yards. But I'll tell he you... Kicked he kicked it low, just, and, he, and he, he just passed it into the net, knowing that the keeper was going to dive to his left. I tell you how ruthless Canavan was. We played in the 2003 quarter final against Fermanagh. Now, we absolutely destroyed them. The game was over in the first 15 minutes. I think we beat them by something like 18 points to end up. But I was, I was through for a goal. It was about maybe two minutes to go. No, it was way into injury time. And I was coming. And I says, look, I'll fist it over the bar and get a handy point. But Canavan was this side here. The full back come to me. I kind of jinked and fisted it over. I get into the change room. Canavan comes to me. Sits down, he says, what are you at? I says, what? What the fuck are you at? I says, what's wrong? The goal was on. He says, I says, for fuck's sake, Pete, we're fucking 18 points up. He says, it doesn't matter. The goal was on. I swear to God, you know, that's the sort of man he was. He, he, ruthless in every way. Yeah. And, and if you look at that, if you look at, you know, I mean, I watched a great documentary there about Larry Bird and 
Magic Johnson, the best of enemies, the Celtics mm. and the Lakers. And that was that thing about kind of when I was thinking about it, you know, there's a great sequence of where Bird's playing in the fourth game of the finals against the Lakers. And the Lakers should be beating them, you know. But Bird's just improbable, you know, the three-point shots from everywhere. And, you know, and AC Green, remembering this now, you know, black guy, great big smile, you know, just think back. it. There's two seconds left. And everybody knows that the Celtics, who are two points down and need the three-pointer to, to win, and it's going to have to be taken as soon as whoever that it's going to bird, and they're all organising out on the out on the court. Mm. And Aaron Scott said that bird came out and he said, "Guys, guys, guys, look, don't worry about this. I'm going to start at the top of the free throw line. I'm going to come to the corner. DJ is going to throw me the ball. I'm going to take it in the air. I'm going to shoot the three pointer. Okay, so you, you don't need to worry about what's going to happen here." You see. And sure enough, he does all that and he showed all in slow motion. And it shows Bird, he's taking the ball, he gets up into the air, and as he lets it off, it comes back to AC Green. And AC Green said, I knew, here comes death. <laughs> that was like that was like Canavan, you know. If Canavan had the chance, if Canavan had the chance to win the to take the win and score, to nail it, mm-hmm. first of all, you knew he was going to take responsibility, because that's what yeah. he did. And you know, and secondly. There wasn't going to be any error, you know. There wasn't going to be any fear, or he was going to do what he did in the run-up. Yeah. All right, it might go wide, but he was going to step up to take that one and score. Oh, I like that. Here comes death, you know, as he did to Arma, as he did to Derry on a few occasions. Yeah. You know, and huge games that were massive breakthroughs for Tron because psychologically, yeah. you know, we would have had the stranglehold in Tron for a long, long, long time until yes. 95, 96. And, like that. Um, but that. That to have a player like that, and and I also put Conor Gormley into that category of you know mm-hmm. here comes death. You know. mm-hmm. One of the interesting things about the two thousand and five final, I thought, was that Sean Kavanagh, who I know that people will say you know it's because of issues between me and Sean, which it really isn't. You know, I mean, I disliked the way he conducted himself in the field. You know, uh, when he was playing, you would have thought that he was playing on a giant bouncy castle. I mean, the bastard couldn't stand up for more than four seconds without rolling around the ground holding his face. You know, and I know he was exactly the same in club football. Many of the day, I would think the Father of Rocks boys were complaining about <laughs> some, some critter being sent off. You know, but, but, but in that 2005 final, I thought that he was the one player who didn't play the team game. You know, continually trying to get his... Now, I don't think he scored, but continually trying to get his own shot off continually sort of, you know, not laying the ball off. And I have to say, he looked really out of place that day with the rest of the group. You know, now I know in 2008, coming down the stretch, he administered the killer blows. And again, he had that winning mentality. But you watch that 2005 final game. He was the one player who didn't play the oh, team. But Joe, game. Jesus, love it. He's, oh, man, Sean Cabin is one of the best midfielders ever played a game. There's a lot of pressure on you on a, fi- on, on a final. There's a lot of pressure on you on the final. Um, some things didn't go his way, but that's the power of the man. If that's a sign of a good player. If it doesn't go your way, you keep going. I knew. I remember he fumbled a couple of balls, but he set up serious scores that day too. And, and you know, I, will, I, he, I disagree with you about that. He no, wasn't that no, I'm telling you, Joe. I'm telling he wasn't, you, he, he, wasn't a, he, he wasn't a playmaker, you know. But he was. But, I mean, but I, I, but I remember. Why, I remember that's Morris. Why, was, that's why he no, he was he was he got a he got a rough day that day. He definitely did. But he he came into his own the last he broke up some serious balls, some serious tackle. You know, I, I, and that's he, 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 he had a great work rate, don't get me wrong. But he was a player who always played for his own score. And in fairness to him in two thousand and eight, coming down the stretch, because I, I, I said it afterwards, you know, I mean, it was that was a great All Ireland final performance because that Jerome team wasn't as good as the 2005 team. Yeah. And I think coming down the stretch in the last seven, eight minutes, I think he kicked maybe four points from play that day. Nah, he was last that day. You he know, was last. And, uh, and again, you know, like, like um, Canavan and like Conor Gormley, Kavanagh, that thing, I'll take responsibility mm. to take that one and score. You know, yeah, like him or hate him. Do you think? Do you think Sean? He was another one. He was. He was another one who brought death. You know, (laughs) like he 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 finished Anthony Joles. 
county career really that day in Keystone Park in the Reed play in 2003. Mm. I think he legs, that day coming from midfield. Legs, you see, legs, legs. So quick. So quick. Yeah. yeah. You know, and a huge it's hard to stop. First time I saw him, I couldn't believe how big he was. I was like, mm. fuck. Uh, but he didn't, at that stage, he wasn't playing big on the field. That was maybe no. around 2003, four. He uh, didn't play like a big man. I uh, could not believe how big he was. Uh, yeah, but he's a fielder too, Joe. He was, he was great he hands on him. Bad, it's a pity the way it's such bad balance. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure that's subjective. That's subjective. Uh, gents, you mentioned 2008, but before we get to 2008, I want to, I want to talk about the journey. So, on, I suppose, what happens, to Rome? Because 2006, no Ulster final, dumped out by Leash in the qualifiers. He only, only scores six points. 2007, Ulster title, but dumped out by Mead. All due respect to Mead. You'd probably expect Tyrone to be winning that match. So what is the general feeling in Tyrone football going into 2008? And also, what is your relationship with Tyrone football going into that championship? Um, you're right. The, the years 2006 were expected to be the leash. Um, mm. Really, really bad day. Uh, I remember it well, and the best, the least crowd were. It was real, like it was like Istanbul sort of atmosphere. Those they, they were in top eight. Then you go to, it was Cork, wasn't it? Cork beat us uh, the next day, I think. Or sorry, the next the next year was it? Uh, me. Sorry, me. Yes, me. Right. Me. Yeah, you would last me. Yes, and seven. Um, I missed about one seven that day, and the papers went to town on the Monday. Saying that we were all finished, the players were all finished. Myself had went, there was a supporters section. Um, my mother always got the Irish news and she read it out to me. And I, it, it, was, it annoyed me now, to be honest, with you, that Mulligan was finished. We were all finished, the likes of Mulligan's finished. Tyrone need to start rebuilding. And that was the, the story we need to rebuild. All right, Hart brought in new fellas, but it was still sort of the nucleus of that team coming through. Um, I got a bad injury, so I don't. And then the first couple of championship games, uh, pulled the hamstring. So I didn't really play 2008, the championship season. So um, I had a club mate, Rim Mulgrew, with me. So we misbehaved most of the 2008 season with a few beers and not really committing. And, you know, it, you, become a, you, you become a sort of a cancer to the team when you're not playing, when you're not injured. I should, don't miss train there. Don't come. Don't, don't go to train. You come. You know, come, come out for a beer with me. And that's you didn't have the likes of the, the Canavans, the Chris Lawns, to pull you, to pull you and say, look, what are you doing? You know, I had that all my. You know, all the the two thousand three season, the two thousand five season. You don't have that senior figure. You are the senior figure, but you're pulling the boys back. So you from the senior from you starting to slipping away down. As a man says, you had a phone number in the back of your jersey in the Northern Ireland final in 2008, number 28 on me or something. Mm. That you never want to be that sort of player. And the 2008 uh, season, I think, was one, probably one of Stephen Neal's best seasons. Um, again, you played, you played Kerry in it. You wanted to be a part of it. Kevin Hughes was back from Australia. You know, you would like playing with him, and suddenly you were down the packing order. And you know, it was a tough season personally for myself, but for winning the Northern Ireland, it was great. Mm. It, yeah, did you were, did you find were, it difficult on that transition? I suppose from just being a free scoring forward, not much pressure on you. You were just enjoying your game. Was it difficult transition then into a senior figure, into being someone that <laughs> has to be relied on? It was. It was. It, uh, Two thousand eight. Now it's really hard to say. It's really selfish on my behalf. I really the medal doesn't really mean as much to me because. I didn't start. It's great for the throne people. It's great for the throne manager. But on a personal note, it doesn't really, you know, there's a 2003 is the best one, then the 2005. But 2008, I would say to the medal, yeah, I, I, I played the game. I, I come on 20 minutes, made a difference. But it's, it's not really. And I said it might be selfish, but that's the way I, I looked at it. Um, I remember coming off the field in 2008 in Cook Park and saying, I'll never let this happen again. I'll never do this again what I did that season and I didn't I started I started all the championship games uh, the next two, three years four years whatever I played because I knew what it meant and I didn't want to be sitting out I didn't want to have that feeling again like our sub bench was Kevin Hughes Brian McGuigan me Marty Penrose 
you know, it was <laughs> it was all the boys that I had grew up with, but we were yeah. all sitting on the bench. And it's you know it's hard to take. Stevie O'Neill had just come back for the All Ireland final. You know, it was you know he had he had started that he had come on that day. You know, that's the sort of things that you know you're either going to start or you're not, and you don't want that ever to happen again. And as I said, it may be a bit selfish, but that's still the way I feel about it. I, I think that um, Owen, at that stage, you know, whatever is because obviously Cookstown is very close to Derry, and you know, Owen had, you know, Owen is so naturally sociable, like you know, and, and loves the fun and loves the crack. And after you know, 2003, 2005, and especially when you got the injury, you, you know, the stories were going around, oh, Jesus, well, like it's, just, it's, it's just party time now, like it's party time. And uh, and I remember thinking, you know, I hope, I hope that, because he was still such a young man, I hope that that's not the end of him as a footballer, I hope he doesn't go down a bad road. And probably, in fact, what happened to you in 2008 was a huge turning point, in hindsight, for the better. Because, I mean, in in 2010, when he led Cookstown to the All Ireland, which is, is a fearsomely difficult. The, to this day, the Father Rocks, to the best of my knowledge, are the only team that have won two All Ireland intermediate club titles. And he led them in 2010, and again in 2013, where he was the key figure in the team. You know, of players who weren't of his ability, and and that really showed his medal. You know, it emphasised this is a man of substance, a man who earned his corn for his county and then went on to show the game the respect it deserves and his club most particularly, you know, to do what he did with his club. And uh, I would think that 2008 was a big turning point for you as a person without, as well. Owen. Without doubt, without doubt, um, as, as I, you, know, you, you know yourself, Joe, when you become that, you know, older player and there's young boys coming in to look up to you, and you maybe missing Trin, not being there. Where's Muggsy at? Um, I remember saying to Hart, ringing Hart and says, you know, my granny's just passed away. And he says to me, how many fucking grannies do you have, Muggsy? You know? And <laughs> 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 you've got excuse so many years, and, and our one was, you know, <laughs> that's the way it was. As if he wasn't going to check the death notices. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? So um, I remember him many years ago after that, Joe, he come to, he come to that, uh, the wake house, and I was sitting, and he shook the hand, he says, oh, she's finally dead. You <laughs> 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 just had a laugh like I just, yeah, like, lost my face, you know. A Lord rest her. Oh yeah. I, sh I shouldn't be laughing at that, but oh, it's all about a crack lad, you know. <laughs> Jens, unfortunately, time is getting the better of us. I, I do want to mention two moments uh, before we go and, and pick your brain on them. Um, we'll go to 2005. No, sorry, we'll stick with 2008. So in 2008, Joe, the 65th minute, I wanted to mention a moment. Five minutes ago, Tyrone had the momentum, but Kerry, with some lovely build of play, work it up the pitch. It comes to Declan O'Sullivan, and it's a wonderful save by Pascal McConnell. Wearing 16, he's a replacement for John Define, whose father sadly passed away beforehand. Like, we can spend all day talking about goals and points, but you have to give credit for these game-changing moments from goalkeepers. It's 2-12 to 14 points at that stage. He made a big save as well in the first half. I think it's in the 23rd minute. Tommy Walsh threw in goal. Probably should have gave the hand pass off the start, but again, a big, big save from, from Pascal. Am I overstating it, Joe, to say a moment like that, a save like that, can drive a team on to see out a match and then go on and ultimately win in All-Ireland? I firmly believe, and I've always believed, that a goalkeeper doesn't save a, a, a very good goal chance. You give the keeper the opportunity to save it. I mean, if you do the right things, if you do your wee dummy, pass it properly into the net, you do all those sorts of things. You see, Colin Cooper never misses a goal chance. Mulligan, I mean, how rarely did one miss a goal chance? You know, Peter Canavan threw one on one. Like, it, it's a checklist of things, and it's a habit, and it's working relentlessly in training. It's like Larry Bird said after Red Arbok said to him, I can't believe you score so many game winning shots. I mean, how do you do it? He said, when you work as hard as I do, you can't afford to miss them. You know, when you put everything into that, and that's your focus and your responsibility to take these. And that was the difference. Declan O'Sullivan took an old blaster at it. I thought it was a pretty easy save for the big man. He was a huge, huge, huge big man. Don't get me wrong. I mean, he must be six foot seven. Old. He he was, that, that was the. He easily get himself out. But a man like that, you're thinking to yourself, yeah. 
mean, I remember Finbar McCollum. I used to say to Finbar, Finbar, you're too big to defend me. I'm just going to put it down there, look. You're too big to get down. Why do they pick such big goalkeepers? I'm sexy anyway. <laughs> Some sort of... Listen, I used, I used to up, oh, like, a, and I would say to them, I'm, I'm going to lob you. And I love loving big guys. I love loving big guys. And I don't know if you remember one day, it was, it was an absolute cauldron. and it was such a bad, bad temper. I think it maybe was in 96, it was, I can't remember, 97 maybe. And my brother Francis had said to me, no matter what happens today, if you fucking score a goal against these <laughs> make sure, make, because boy, had they rubbed, us in, rubbed it into us after 95, you see, when they had the two men sent off. We were down to 14, they were down to 13, you see. But anyway, um, my brother says, whatever you do, you fucking make sure you blow kisses whether you want to or not. And I remember anyway, I was at Fimber. Oh, I said, you know, this is going to be such fun because not only are we going to beat you, I'm going to lob you. And then, <laughs> fuck off. And fuck off. And you know, Finbar was quite an innocent big fella. He didn't know if I was being serious or not. And I was saying, I, I, I was shouting over to our other forwards, oh, just get it to me, get it to me. I'm going to lob the big man. I cannot fucking wait to see what this looks like on TV tonight. It says, blah, 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 blah. blah. <laughs> and then Dermot Duggan set me through and I was through one-on-one -on -one with him, you see. And he stayed up. He thought he's good at love me. I just fucking put it in the ground at his feet, you know, into the bottom of the net. <laughs> and, and he went down belatedly. And, he said, and of course, I tussled his hair and I, went, I said, You stupid. <laughs> I said, How in the name of Jesus did you think I was going to love you? <laughs> <laughs> me, as I was blowing kisses up <laughs> on people who were going crazy. Uh, <laughs> Face is uh, purple. So, I mean, I, I, know, I know the point you're making. Obviously, if that goes in the net, but that's the Kerry player's responsibility. You know, if that had been him, if that had been Mulligan, it would have been in the net. If it had been Canavan, it would have been in the net. These are the decisive moments. This is the game. Mm. The game isn't running about working hard and trying your best. These are the decisive moments. So you always ask yourself the question about a team. A team is great if that team is able to make decisive contributions. And that was true. You know, coming down the stretch in 08, most of 2005, Dominant throughout the 2003 final, you know, and absolutely dominant against Kerry in the 2003 semi final. They were a team that were habitually making decisive contributions. So the answer to your question is no, I disagree with it and reject your premise. I, I think it's my mistake asking two rootless forwards to give any credit to a goalkeeper. There's <laughs> <laughs> a figure of fun, isn't that right, Muggsy? That's He's there right. for your amusement. That's right. <laughs> I have to sign up for the goalkeepers union somehow. Uh, coincidentally, actually, now my final question also invo involves a goalkeeper. 2005, nine minutes gone. Oh, no, I'll direct this question at yourself. Colin yeah. Cooper is hit. 15 years later now, can you confirm, firstly, if Gooch was targeted and if Pascal made contact in a premeditated manner? Because I think uh, Gooch referenced in his book that that Kerry lacked anger. They didn't have the energy to match Tyrone. Uh, he, he wrote, anyway, that he got grit in his eye from a goalkeeper's glove. Mick Monaghan, the referee, comes over, stands over Cooper and just tells him not to retaliate. The umpires, no one saw anything. And then I think the, 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 the quote is, I'm rattled now. We, we were rattled. The lack of anger says a lot more about us because all we have to return to Tyrone is just noise. So was it a premeditated incident? I don't think it was as a, I'm going to stick my finger into your eye here, mm. but he was definitely, definitely targeted. You know, I don't know if Peggy says, right, I'm going to do this on purpose. It was probably a tussle. And, yeah. You know, but if you're Gooch Cooper, you're one of the best forwards in Ireland. Of course, you're going to get targeted. The same as Alan Brogan, the same as Patrick Joyce. We have to target the special players to win games, to see out games. Yeah, um, you know, that's the way it is. If, 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 if a player, if, if, if I shook a player's hand and he didn't, he didn't put his hand on me or put, pull my jersey, I would be rubbing my hands and saying, I'm in for some day here. I'm in, you chalk, the, chalk, get the chalk out and get the board. <laughs> Look, just that there. You know what I mean? We've all the best players, the Sean Marty Lockers, the Nell McC McCuskers, Bellew. Like, Bellew didn't mark you by the jersey. He marked you by the skin. Do you know what I mean? You know, that's, that's the man. He was, he didn't, you know, he was, like, our 2003 final, down the left and right side, grab marks. But great tussles. That's what you, that's what you expected. So, you know what I mean? You, you have to expect that sort of, you know, 
you know that intensity that you bring into mm-hmm. like, any games. Defenders have to. Defenders, have, like, I think this is what I call defenders. You're somebody's. You're somebody's for that hour. You're running around after somebody for an hour and what ten minutes. You have to do something in your own power to get that the, the forward. So if forwards think that they're not going to get attention, you know, even this, they're they're deluded, deluded. I I just, I just think what was most striking from that is just that that Cooper mentions that they there wasn't any anger. It was just noise. That's all they, they that team had to give to Tyrone back. Like it reminds me of when when I was watching it back. He looks a bit lost and like such such a an iconic forward that Colin Cooper is. He does look a bit lost. Like, Joe, in a weird and wonderful world, if you were the manager of Kerry at that time, what response would you want from your Kerry players when an incident like that happens? Because I suppose the first thing that struck in my head, actually, was was a very random one of the Lions rugby tour in 1974 and that 99 call. So if one player gets hit, Willie John McBride was captain at the time, that everyone retaliates. So if you hear 99, you hit the closest man next to you. Like, I'm not saying, I'm not inciting violence, but what response would you want from a Kerry team to stand up for your teammates? You know, you can, you can do the histrionical thing. You know, you can do that male me thing that happened um, where Liam McKeel gets sent off and Colm Coyle gets sent off and you can do all that sort of thing. But it doesn't really make any difference. The issue again is, can you back it up? Have you got the players? Have you got the players with the mentality to see this out? Once it gets hot, once it gets tight, you know, and you do have your opportunities and you create those opportunities, will you take them? Will you drive it home? I, I make the point again just because it's in my mind. Will you bring death? You know, what are you prepared to do? What are you prepared to do? And are you, are you going to be cool-headed when it comes down the stretch? You know, are you going to work harder than them? Are you going to work smarter than them? Are you just going to be too much for them? And the bottom line is, whatever way you look at that, that Tyrone team was better, tougher, faster, more talented than that Kerry team. That's the bottom line. Three times doesn't lie. You know, three times spanning a period of six years does not lie. And I think that the, the, the problem was that, let's, let's say, let's turn it around. Let's say it was Peter Canavan who'd been suffering abuse from the Kerry keeper and the Kerry cornerback. Do you think anybody, do you think Peter Canavan would be writing a book saying, well, we just didn't have the anger. We just didn't have their energy. Fuck that. Peter Canavan would say, fuck you. You want to take me off? Are you fucking joking? I mean, we saw Peter Canavan in the Aussie rules whenever your man Akramanis took him on. Much bigger, much more powerful, more violent guy who had nothing to lose. Fuck you. This will not stand. You know, and... Each man, each man in that circumstance must, must look into himself and say, like, what sort of man am I? Am I up for this? You know, how far am I prepared, prepared to go? And the bottom line was that Tyrone were prepared to go farther and harder and they, just, they, they, had, and they had the ability to match it. It wasn't just that they were going out intimidating and, you know, playing fearlessly and all of that. They just had all of, the, all of those complex things that come together once in a generation to create a group like that. And, um, and I mean, of course, if Owen Mulligan hadn't taken Raymond Mulgrew under his wing, he was going to be the next one. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if you hadn't been sort of teaching Raymond Mulgrew how to bury your arse out the window to Mickey Hart. <laughs> <laughs> Modern drone football might have had another superstar. <laughs> That's your responsibility, Mulligan. <laughs> Well, on that note, gentlemen, I, I'm sure that's wet the appetite to, uh, to review and watch the 2005 All-Ireland Final, Tyrone and Kerry, and the 2008 All-Ireland Final, Tyrone and Kerry as well. Tyrone Night, live in air sport, is coming up. Joe Brawley, Owen Mulligan, thank you both very much for your time. Cheers, lads. Cheers, lads. Thank you.